Well, that was a hard act to follow, but <laughs> I mean, in terms of like um, being an artist, I think we're more interested also in this, uh, we're very interested in these ethical issues, but we're also extremely interested in the potentials of um, helping scientists to try to actually be a kind of, or create a kind of catalyst scenario between science and the public. If you ask people about their neural um, network and their actual condition and the nerves and the axons and where they are in the body and what's going on, most people actually do not know. The uh, naive, the level of understanding of our own human bodies is one thing I'm going to address in my talk. And this is the problem I think that we need to think about from a transdisciplinary perspective, that we actually don't know enough about our bodies. And with that knowledge comes the questioning about how we think. And thinking is very, very important from knowledge, from the understanding, and not just from this sort of out from the thin air. So I'm going to go on talking about perception, which is at the heart of both disciplines of art and science. And as we know, perception is about these trillions of sensory and afferent motor neurons and feedback issues that are really loops that really go a part of our whole concept of thinking and understanding. And in neuromedia was a, was a term I coined about 10 years ago. Um, and I started working on my own work with this concept coming from a background of media art and then actually learning about neuroscience. How can I put these two disciplines together in order to help our, raise our understanding of our neural conditions and of probably then after that the ethical issues that surround us because of our neural conditions. So I'm going to talk about uh, neuromedia for me, uh, hybrids of artistic interpretation and neuroscience research about how our sensory perception might be stimulated. Um, they are collective attempts, if you like, to demystify the complexity of perception and brain plasticity. And they're artworks with interactive technologies that combine the viewer's own perceptive modalities and behavior with scientific research on the same subject. And combinations of self-reflection and scientific objectivity are essential to the idea of neuromedia. As we know, um, probably most of us might know in this room, um, there's different divisions of research going on within neuroscience. S neuroscience particularly is the insight into the genetic control of the neural system, development, degeneration, disease and function mechanisms of the nervous system and resultant behaviours. Cognitive science, in Europe at least, is to understand the mind, how we think, its relation to what we think. Um, it has more psychological, emotional, human behavior, and human subjects are much more studied. Cognitive neuroscience is a biological, bi bi biological substrates underlying in cognition with a special focus on neural substrates of mental processes. And then animal and human subjects are used in both areas. And I'm just doing this because I'm, my whole talk is going to be about understanding the neural system. In my own experience, um, I've worked in, as an artist in labs as well, and I've worked in this uh, lab at the Institute for Molecular Life Sciences. And it's been really fascinating to realize that most people have no idea about how molecules guide axons to their direct and um, correct target cells. And it's been very interesting for me to think about how molecular mechanisms underlining the neural circuit function can actually um, uh, help us to understand how an artist might approach new works and how our sensory perception might be thought of in new ways from the artistic viewpoint. This lab that I was working in was studying the development of diseases of the nervous system. Um, Summer book, they were, they're doing development studies here. They I became very interested in how to use tactile feedback in order to access neuroscience research, how to shift the artist's role towards a communicator of a more scientifically robust research knowledge about neural impairment, and how to raise public awareness by looking at those impairments more specifically, and to learn about molecular neural research in a novel way. 
I think we, this sort of top-down approach often in science doesn't really work for our, the majority of the public. It's too um, uh, much based on a, a concept of um, diagrams, graphs, constructions that tend to turn people off who are visually literate and interested in much more tactile feedback and information. So this project, for example, is a cut through the neural tube. Um, it's a sculpture that's based, the surface of it is based on the um, images from the scanning electron microscope. Um, as you know, the scanning electron microscope can only actually image in 2D from frozen specimens. So actually what I'm trying to do is like build these sculptures that take the 2D images from the scanning electron microscope and actually build it into a 3D shape and form so that people can actually interact with that form on a large scale. And scale is a really big issue. So this is a project about the somatic cortex. It's about the five overlapping representational maps that help us function or be embodied in our environment. These are texture, shape and size, stretch, translation of information, and the correlation between our somatic cortex and other cortexes, of course, in our brain. So in this project, um, in uh, neuroscience, in this lab, they're doing this thing called an open book method of dissection, which was a great inspiration for me to think about this open book method of dissection as like two touch screens that you can actually access information based on the, uh, on the fact that the, in this dissection, the neural tube actually falls apart like an open book. So here you have the possibility of actually feeding, for example, ethanol into an egg and seeing the results of the neural deformation that takes place over the embryonic, in the embryonic stage of a chicken embryo in vivo. You also have the possibility of putting your hand inside the actual object, the neural tube. Inside there are stripped sensors and as you actually play with those sensors, you have the potential to actually see what happens to growth cones as they grow across the screen. And growth cones are like, one scientist told me, a blind man's hand actually searching in the dark. So this became the metaphor that I actually adopted into a project and actually used in the sculpture. And for me, this is really interesting to take actually the metaphors from that scientists use, the literal metaphors they use, and to take those and bring them into a more visual, poetic metaphors. This is really interesting potentials that artists have. So I wanted to think about interpreting these growth patterns, movements and coordination through movements. So I actually work with a dancer. I talked to the scientists about taking eggs home that were neurally impaired and hatching them. But of course, the Ethics Commission really just <laughs> told me there's just not possibility of this. So instead, I started to work with a dancer who could actually, he was very familiar with this thing called mind-body contact, which is about sort of understanding their working consistently on the peripheral nerves and developing kind of the muscles of the motor feedback in the peripheral nerves in, an, in the muscles to actually kind of um, help them um, coordinate their movements. In another project called the Electric Retina, um, as a visual artist, of course, my interest turned very, very strongly into understanding how the neural system works, this photoreceptor system in the retina. And here, this lab, for example, I worked in, they're working on the facets of visual pigment regeneration, they're working on behavioral consciousness of wiring defects in the optic nerve, and they're using as their model the cone-dominated uh, uh, zebrafish. Um, your eyes are the eyes of a fish, I came up with as a, a, as a kind of slogan for this piece. Because actually, all of, almost all of the visual research uh, done on visual perception is done on the zebrafish because the, they're a dunal animal and basically the cones and the rods are fairly similar patterns to our own. So here you have a possibility of um, looking, of course, in histology. Um, they're using various typical neuroscience uh, technologies to image their research. But uh, one of the things that struck me the most, as most interesting as an artist and as also as a media artist was this project um, based on a thing called an optokinetic response. One automatically asks, how can you measure a fish's in, um, visual acuity? And so this is a really big problem. How do you measure it? So this is actually a, a setup that's uh, experimentally based. Um, you have a camera that actually looks at a fish that's embedded into a liquid. 
Um, and that fish is uh, uh, immobilized by that liquid. It doesn't actually hurt it. It seems to swim off quite fine afterwards. Um, there is projected stripes onto that panorama around the fish. Then one can measure the visual acuity of the fish as they follow the stripes around in the circles. I mean, this to me became very fascinating as evidence of eye disease. And then I was looking at the um, de degeneration and genetics of eye disease. And as I was looking at these uh, uh, amazing histologies and results of these experiments, um, I realized that I actually couldn't focus properly on the two uh, uh, eyepieces of the microscope myself. And I found out that I had glaucoma. So in that uh, process of actually being involved in the lab, I started to work with my own very subjective problems of having this disease myself. So it was very interesting. Now, as an artist, we would find that incredibly fascinating, that we're actually involved in a lab doing this research, and we're actually looking at our, you know, we're finding out something about our own impairments along the way. So this piece called the electric retina was actually fashioned again on the scanning electron microscope images, putting them into a three-dimensional space. And actually, um, the position is that the viewer kind of stands inside the brain, and they're looking out through the photoreceptor cones um, into uh, the world. And consequently, um, there is an iris on the other side of the um, uh, sculpture, and the viewer can actually change that. And as they do, they, they see the re reactions or the results between the actual scientific research taking place inside the cones and the actual results of the impairments that have been shot underwater, interpretive kind of films that have been shot underwater that show those impairments um, projected onto the back wall. So in a way, this, was, this whole surface is actually based on the c cone and rod pattern array of the photoreceptors. Um, that uh, show that where the visual acuity takes place in the optical disc and in the um, relation to, um, to, to of the rods and cones to each other. And so it became really fascinating for me to think about animating scientific evidence. So uh, scientists don't often animate their evidence, but for me it was very fascinating to take their, their evidence and to actually morph it to manipulate it, things they were kind of no, never allowed to do. Um, put it in Photoshop, change the colors, shift the constructions of it in order to get some more deeper uh, uh, communication about the problems across. And so uh, uh, here you see Fish Noir, which is actually one of their big uh, favorite uh, projects where they saved fish's vision um, that it had vitamin A deficiency by feeding it a certain levels of fatty acids and restoring its vision. Or here you see um, my glaucoma. Uh, I went in course and did all my own uh, surveys on my own glaucoma and integrated that into the actual work. This is what I was talking about. It's trying to get this subjective and objective approaches into the same artwork so that actually it reaches out to people in a different way rather than a sheer science museum exhibits which tell you what to know. Um, so these are the sorts of things that are integrated into my works. I'm trying to do this subjective and objective approaches into the same projects. So the aim is to raise viewer awareness about eye disease and to use scale as a model for learning about vision and to represent this relationship, if you like, between mutant behavior and visual perception and to humanize, one could say, and that's the big thing we'll talk about probably later in our panel, how to humanize research so that actually people understand what's going on and they therefore understand their own bodies and they therefore, therefore understand their neural systems and the relationship between bodily perception and the mind. This is a project as it's shown in an installation. So these are exactly summer book in fact where you see that I've actually also have images on the windows. I use the natural light of the windows to actually give images about the origins of the sculptures and the ideas behind them from the scientific, more objective viewpoint on one window and the more subjective viewpoints on other windows. And then I have documentaries that are in the project which show the process of, being, of constructing those projects where the viewer can sit and listen to films and, docu and, and interviews from the scientists match with my own process of building the actual project. So you see, in fact, the way in which the ideas have been formed. <laughs>
Here's another project. This is the electric retina. And here you see the projection more clearly out the back of the actual object. And see, so you see also, you can sit down, you can actually, the viewer can actually, there's some um, drawings actually on the tables here. You see there's a table there in front of the, of the film. And there's uh, drawings. And as you, uh, you can take pieces of paper and you can draw storyboards for film of ideas and fictions that you'd like to actually draw. And then the museum, is, uh, Culturama, is actually putting those drawings downstairs for viewers. So the viewers actually are able to develop stories within the exhibit itself. So I haven't worked a lot in cognitive science, but I've worked a lot in neuroscience. And, um, but my, in the Artist in Labs program, which I've been running for 12 years, we've put about 32 artists into different science labs. And we've put about 12 artists into neuroscience. And those labs have been um, very, very much looking at behavior. And of course, they're using the EEG as one of the main technologies to, to uh, measure or so-called measure behavior. And here you see um, a stimulus of music and the reactions in the brain in different parts on the alpha beta waves to music um, uh, interpreted live by the brain. So one artist would be um, that I want to mention is Nicole Ottinger. She's actually worked with the VR neuroscience. Neuroscience is now particularly um, in the concept of consciousness, um, looking at using virtual reality techniques. In other words, now they're using our technologies from the arts, in a way, and from the media arts, to actually look at what happens in certain behavior. So this is a development here in this lab in Lausanne. They're looking at the development of data-driven neuroscience um, theory of self-consciousness and subjectivity. And they're looking at this balance between bodily perception and um, applications to engineering. So here, for example, Nicole, in this case, offers herself as a subject, in a way, to actually be studied by the scientists um, as her res part of her residency. And she's interested in how she can kind of um, um, work with uh, this, these concepts that they're working with, but extend them. In other words, the scientists are learning a great deal from having an artist working with them because their perception levels and her reactions to experiments are quite different from their own. In this experiment, there's a virtual reality camera looking at the back of your body. And she's actually uh, standing there. She's drawing. So she, was in she integrated drawing into the experiment. And the idea is that as she's drawing on a page in front of her, she's wearing virtual reality goggles. And she's stroked on the back with a, um, a pole. And as she's stroked on the back, she feels like her body is jumping out of her own physical body towards the, pro to the drawing that she's making. And this experience is actually almost standard for everybody according to the experiments that they've actually been uh, working with. This has become a, a very, very interesting idea of how to work that you see now the the actual media art technologies infiltrating into the actual science uh, experiments. Another person, Sandra Jo Huber, worked with neuroscientist Paul Franklin at the Integrative Genomics Laboratory. And there they're working on um, energy and homeostasis in sleep. And they are investigating all molecules and the effect of homeostatic process and interaction on the circadian process. But for an artist, this is a very interesting, particularly a poet, as uh, Sandra is, this was a very interesting um, trajectory because poets have likened the behavior of sleep to death in many, many histories. And, but it's a very active state, she learned, so it was very fascinating for her to try and think about how would you write a poem as a subject in a science experiment, and then how would you actually sort of map that poetry back out onto your own map of your own brain uh, uh, scans and reactions over a period of sleep. So they became very fascinating, the scientists, in actually this new approaches that an artist would take as a subject in their own lab. These are the EEG patterns that are actually causing her, uh, inspiring her to write her visual poetry. So the conclusions I have is that there's a value for artists and scientists in collaborating together, um, and particularly in neuroscience. 
And this concept is that with artists, um, understanding neuroscience helps embody users about neural systems in relation to their environment. As a, most media artists are fascinated with the idea of interaction, there's a potential there that is not really, um, uh, it's so close to the understanding of perception that it's a very, very interesting, there's almost a very, very thin line, in fact, between art and science in these levels. And she's interested, I mean, we're, we're all interested in this sort of new roles of representation. In other words, what is it to have a disability or an ability or an impairment? And to what level do we see them as impairments or are they just art abilities? Are they, can we see these sorts of problems, so-called problems, in different ways? We're also interested in offering other artists hands-on access to wet labs. In wet labs you have live materials that you wouldn't normally find in your art studio. And this is very fascinating for artists because they have the material uh, means to actually work in a very, very different ways with access to tools that would normally would never have. And to create interpretations for know-how transfers on genetically, molecular and cellular levels. When I first was looking and listening to all the PhD students talking in, in the lab about development, neural development, when I first was listening to them talk about molecular research, it was so complex. There's about 600 molecules that they only know so far that are guiding axons to their target cells in development. It's like a theater. It's explained like a road sign. There's a road, and there's different signs, and they're all different molecules. There's attraction molecules, repulsion molecules. All kinds of different molecules guide the development of your axons to their target cells in the right places. This, for me, was really fascinating because I started to think about making even drama, plays, theater events, where all those characters would be represented, some way of transferring that information to the public in a different way than just lists of molecules and their reactions and what they do. So I also think it's important that artists deal with this ethics of human-animal research. And animals are the surrogates for humans in, this, in these labs. And it's extremely important that we understand what the ethics commissions in science believe in and how they are conducting those ethics commissions. And who's deciding to what level animal experimentation can take place or not. So artists in our neuroscience group have learned about behavioral debates in cognition. They've learned about offering themselves as subjects to humanize the technology, again putting this idea of the very subjective and very objective together approaches. <coughs> Excuse me. They're interested in making reflections about cognitive science research that extend view of perception. They're interested in combining these with poetic metaphors to create unique levels of communication. And they're interested in focusing on deep levels of embodiment in the viewer, listener, or participant. But the question is, what did the scientists get out of it? And that's very important uh, that we've actually been doing this study as a research group for years about what is this interface we're talking about in art and science? What do scientists get out of having an artist in the lab making interpretations about their current research? Well, these are the quotes, actually, from the book that we've published. We've published three or four books right now with Springer. And these books are very essential um, to understand what these uh, collaborations are really about. So I'll just read you these. I think they're interesting. Working alongside a media artist allowed us to access different approaches and point of view about our own research and how to bring it to the public. It gave us the ability to see an experiment or problem from another perspective and to think about building our own differently. That is really, I think, very, very essential. We gained a lot of training in answering all those great why questions from the artists. The know-how transfer of neuroscience is easier than we thought to a non-scientist. They had these preconditions about how difficult it would be, and they were surprised that it wasn't so difficult. It was interesting for us to watch the interpretive processes unfold, 
from conception to production and presentation of the media artwork to the public. And we realised that media art could be a catalyst for the opening up of more discourses about perception in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>